All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the State of the Heart podcast. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Sanatani. Uh, thank you for being a guest on my podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, one of the questions I have, uh, so one of the first things we're going to talk about is um, uh, the equipment used to uh, for a pacemaker to adjust uh levels and to like lower the heart rate and uh so can you give me uh some hints on like how you how you, how you control the pacemaker to like make it for uh, a, a kid who uh would think it's like good sure for, good for them so. yeah well let, let's step back a moment there's yeah. there's two main heart rhythm devices that are that are implanted um, one is a pacemaker, which is primarily there to prevent low heart rates yep. and to, to boost the heart rate. And the, the, the pacemaker can, can do that very well. And then there's a relatively newer device called a defibrillator or an ICD. And, uh, and that device always includes a pacemaker. Well, I shouldn't say always because the technology has changed, but yeah. it typically includes a pacemaker as well as a defibrillator. The defibrillator uh, can deliver therapies to treat fast heart rates. So yeah. it can can shock the heart or or even sometimes do, you know, pacing maneuvers to stop fast heart rates. Yeah. So once a child once a child needs either a pacemaker or a defibrillator, um, then we have, you know, the, the computer technology within them is very sophisticated. It can tell what the child needs in terms of, you know, if a child is active. Uh, it can monitor the heart rate continuously. It can sense dangerous rhythms. And, of course, we, we do regular checkups, and we can do the checkups uh, in two ways. We can do them remotely where there's a, a modem with the child okay, or uh, in person where we, you know, you come into the clinic and we have a have a computer that will talk to the pacemaker and we can make the adjustments there. Okay, so it's like, uh, so it's like, could I know when I have, uh, when I when when I go to appointments, we usually do the uh, personal, I think, the the one with the device, the magnet. Yeah, when yeah. you're here, it's uh, it's a it's using the programmer from the company, and uh, and, and then we'll do a usually have a. A couple of people in the room checking things out, and yeah, making adjustments. Yeah, um, so I know that you've been with me since the day I was born, right? Yeah, it's been a long yeah. time. Yeah, it has. Uh, how was um, what was your journey to becoming uh, a doctor? How well, was, how was it? My uh, my journey has been uh, has I've been very fortunate along the way. I I did a you know a, an undergraduate degree in biochemistry and then I, I went to medical school here at, uh, at UBC. I always knew I wanted to work with with children and so I did a pediatrics residency in Kingston, at okay. Queens. Uh, and then I came back to, to Vancouver and did, uh, did cardiology training. Okay. And then I went to Toronto to do some electrophysiology training, so wow. heart rhythm training. Nice. And then I came back here and did some some further training in uh, in adult electrophysiology, and then finally I got a job uh, many years later. And nice. I think uh, I think I met you in in the my first or second year on the job. And oh, really? You met me on the first or second year? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, that's a long time. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, did you ever have any um, like struggle in becoming a doctor? Like. Um, did you, was there a point that you thought that you couldn't, like, make it or you always had, like, you always, like, knew that you would make it? Like, did you ever f feel like you failed and then you got back up? Well, I think the uh, the, the journey to becoming a doctor and, and doing medical school, there's, there's quite a, there's quite a supportive network and, uh, you know, classmates and teachers and and the, the the program is very well structured, and so um, you know when obviously you you work very hard, but you're you're not alone. Yeah. And so um, 
I've actually found it more challenging as a as an attending physician at times um, in terms of the things one faces and the responsibility. So, uh, but it's a like probably like most things, it's a it's a journey with ups and downs and yeah and uh, and tough days and and great days yeah. and I bet you have much you must have like long days of studying. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> the uh, the uh, lots of uh, lots of late nights and, yeah. and early mornings and. How long does it take to become um, uh, what you are now? How many how many school years? Well, so I so I'm a pediatric heart rhythm specialist or a pediatric electrophysiologist, and I I took a slightly longer path. Um, one could probably do it in in less years if you if you took a more direct route, but. I, I spent about um, I spent about uh, fifteen or sixteen years um, getting the getting to where I was. Wow! And um, it's a long now, journey. of course, it's a, it's a long journey, but it's you know I yeah. If you enjoy it, it's it, uh, you know yeah. I'm very grateful for it. And, yeah. and at this point, to think, wow, there was a time when I was getting paid to learn. Yeah. That feels very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And. Uh, and uh, the the schooling part, I mean, medical school even back back when I went to medical school, by the time you were in your last year, you got a little a little uh, salary to to uh, to offset your costs. So okay, you do you do you do earn, you earn some money um, as a the the first step of training. You're you're called a resident, and so you do start earning some money. So it's not um, you don't have to live in. Uh, yeah. You know, live in your parents' basement and uh, eat macaroni and cheese the whole time. Yeah. But uh, you do come out, uh, more so now even, you come out of the training with quite a bit of personal debt. Oh, um, really? Because you, the, the cost is quite expensive. Oh. Okay, so it so it's costs a lot of money? Yeah, medical school tuition is generally higher than, than, really? other, uh, than undergraduate tuitions. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, so, and as long as you enjoy it, right, that's the fun, that's the best, that's the fun part, as long as you enjoy what you're doing. Absolutely. I, you know, and I feel, uh, I, I, you know, you've probably heard people say this and, you know, as your, your family talks about where you're heading, the, you know, you you find something that you love doing and it it doesn't feel like work. So, uh, that I was very lucky to meet people along the way who guided me and, and so I, uh, I love what I do, and yeah. that, that makes it much more manageable to, yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, so going back to uh, uh, the, pace, the pacemaker, um, uh, you, you want to talk about why I needed a pacemaker? Uh, I'm comfortable to talk about that. Are, are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay yeah. with it? So yeah. we can talk a little bit about your your yeah. story and your you you were actually very unwell as a as an infant. I still remember. Yeah. Uh, I still remember what spot you were in in the intensive care unit and looking at some of your heart rhythm tracings. You had very complicated heart rhythms. You were you were even on life support. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, more than once, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I so you're yeah. you know you you. You talk about my journey being long and difficult. Your your journey is uh, is comparable. Yeah. Um. So, and, and over the years, it, as we followed you, we we noticed some irritability in your in your heart's electrical system, and and, and you have you had an interesting combination of having both uh, some some tendency to slowness and some fast rhythms. So, yeah. um, so you know, simplistically, without fully knowing what what is happening in the cells in your heart clearly some of your early journey and the and the you know the scars that are there created some pathways for dangerous rhythms yeah and so uh the most dangerous rhythms were the very fast ones uh you know causing you to collapse yeah the cardiac arrest right and then and then uh and unfortunately you were you know you were quickly resuscitated and yeah. obviously came out of it very yeah uh, very yeah. well and so that that's why you you know you would need a an icd or a defibrillator yeah um and, and uh you know to have a cardiac arrest and and have complex congenital heart disease unfortunately is 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 not that uncommon um 
but it is still relatively rare. So certainly most of our kids uh, don't need defibrillators. Yeah. Okay. So. So um, so it's really rare then for defibrillators, right? Defibrillators are most common in the in older individuals, okay. um, especially who have, you know, what you know, coronary artery disease or you know, adult okay. onset heart disease. Yeah. Um, in certain types of congenital heart disease, we we see defibrillators more and more and more. Okay. So, um, another question I had for you was, um, where were what were you doing during the time of my uh, cardiac arrest? What was your role? Uh, so, as the as the heart rhythm specialist here at the at at, at Children's, um, my role would be to to first of all uh, to figure out if there's a cause uh, that we could treat a reversible cause, um, and then in in your case there 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 isn't a, a an easily fixable cause or something that could be treated with yeah. medicine or an operation yeah. um, and so you know my role is to to assist the in our program the surgeons put in the the defibrillators and I you know and I assist with uh, the programming uh, I don't okay. know if you recall this but we actually test the defibrillator in oh. the operating room so okay. some places, especially in adult programs, they are getting away from testing defibrillators um, in the operating room, but we still feel there's some value to it. So we actually create a mini cardiac arrest in the operating room oh, really? and, uh, and test the defibrillator. Okay. And so that, you know, I'm involved in that. And then, of course, following you, uh, following you along since that time. Okay, so um, you program. So what you do... When I go see, when I go see you in the uh, pacemaker room, we you on a computer. Is that usually what you did? We're we're checking to see that your device is is working properly, that it's communicating with your heart properly, yeah, and that they uh, that it's not seeing anything concerning where we might need to either change how it's programmed or you know add medication things like that. Okay. So um, with uh pacemaker defibrillators um are there some uh side effects to having them well you might be in a better position to tell me about yeah. some of them they unfortunately and and i have a you know i have a pediatric perspective so def defibrillators are designed for uh, mostly adults who are not as active as young people who yeah. aren't growing and so those two factors result in, you know, a much higher complication rate in young people. So young people have a higher incidence of, of, of device complications than older people. Mm -hmm. And people can get a shock sometimes when they don't need them. And a lot of people have, a, have, have like a post-traumatic stress reaction to the fact that they, you know, that they had a cardiac arrest and now have a device. So it's, the, the psychological impact of these devices is is pretty significant in some people. Yeah. So if a person who has a pacemaker defibrillator like me, if that person receives a shock while there was no reason to receive a shock, what would happen in that case? So what you're referring to, we, we often call inappropriate shock. So the device thinks you need it, but, you know, biologically you may not have needed it the devices are actually very good so they don't usually make mistakes but sometimes they they can be tricked they can count one heartbeat as two heartbeats or something you know something like that there's usually okay. a reason for them doing it yeah um sometimes it's some you know it's a matter of you know where again where we haven't programmed it properly or the device needs a, a, an adjustment sometimes it's a medication um it can be quite painful to get a shock when you're awake and you don't need one yeah uh, so it's certainly something we want to avoid okay so if so do i come in like if say if i had a shock do i start to still have to come in for checkup and everything absolutely a, uh, will it be an emergency situation or not well if you start getting multiple shocks 
uh, that's an emergency because it's okay. quite painful and can be dangerous. Yeah. Um, if you get, for example, let's say you're, you know, running on the soccer field or the ball hockey and you uh, you get a shock and you feel otherwise fine, that, that would be a situation where we'd probably just have you phone us, we'd talk it over. We would want to still see you. Now, I mentioned the remote monitoring system. Yeah. A lot of our follow-up can be done with, with the remote monitoring system. So most device companies now have a system where um, patients with defibrillators can have a, you know, have a modem at home and send us information. Yeah, that's what I have. And then uh, that can yeah. save you you know, save you the physical yeah. trip of coming down. Yeah. Um, if th there's programming adjustments we need to make, sometimes you do have to do have to come down. But yeah. I know certainly the, you know, the the big adult clinics that see a lot of these patients do a lot of, you know, remote follow up. Yeah. So the pacemaker um, device that's at home, um, it connects to your pacemaker, right? And then, it talks and, to your personal yeah. one, and, and then, then it sends us yeah. information into a, a secure database. Okay, I see. That's cool. It's great technology, uh, technology. and it's, it's saved yeah. people a lot of time yeah. uh, going to appointments. Yeah. Okay, I see. Sorry. All right, so um, I think that's about it. That's all the questions I had. Well, so thanks so much thank, for having thank me. You so much, thank you so much for being. I think this is a really cool, yeah. uh, really cool initiative, and will probably, yeah. you know, help other people learn a bit more about yeah. uh, about yeah. uh, what uh, what you're uh, what you're sharing with them. Yeah, thank you so much for being uh, on my podcast as a guest, and I uh, really appreciate it. And before you go, I actually got a, I actually got you an own shirt. Oh, in fantastic. Case you, in case you want to wear a I, I whole my knee thing. I will definitely wear it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So uh, that was the first episode of the Stead Heart Podcast. Uh, thank you so much. And see you later. Peace.